Hi, it's Thursday, November the 24th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, the first letter, at least the one we call the first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. Uh, when Paul began the chapter, basically he was upset that members of the, the church were um, suing each other in court. They were appealing to, to secular courts to do things. They were well, I wondered whether he was upset that they were airing their dirty laundry in public or whether they were seeking wisdom that was not holy wisdom. And he sort of leaned into both, I thought. Um, but, but no matter how you read it, Paul was very clear about sort of keeping the church world separate from the secular world. Keep the sacred stuff in here uh, and that other stuff out there. Not as good as us, so let's stay away from that. Um, and in dealing with the immorality within our own community, so within this church community, um, the people who aren't really complying with the way of Jesus or the will of God, uh, then we should kick them out into the secular world. That's where they belong. They can choose to come back. At least I was being kind, saying that Paul would say they could choose to come back. Um, but Paul was at least saying, get them out. Um, and so he continues sort of on that vein, and let's see what happens. So 1 Corinthians 6, 12-20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said the two shall be one flesh, but anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So that's how Paul wraps up this chapter. A bunch of things to wonder about. Um, again, I would love to be sitting down with Paul and, and, and just drilling into what he means here. Um in the text, uh, there's a couple pieces in quotes, all right? So, all things are lawful for me is in quotation, okay? Quote, all things are lawful for me, end quote, but not all things are beneficial. Quote, all things are lawful for me, end quote, but I will not be dominated by anything. Quote, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, end quote, and God will destroy both one and the other. Sometimes people will read that all as Paul just getting some rhetorical rhythm going. Um, others will read it uh, as if Paul is having a conversation with himself, which Paul, we, we certainly discovered that in Romans. Paul loves to talk to himself. Uh, it's a literary device. I think it works well, and I think that's what Paul's doing here. So Paul is imagining the challenge to what he is saying, and then he is answering it back. So he is saying that the people in the church in Corinth would likely go, well, but all things are lawful for me. After all, I am forgiven in Christ. After all, I am part of a holy community. After all, I recognize God's presence uh, in Jesus. All of those things. I have, I have passed all those things. I belong to the church. I get who Jesus is. So then all things are lawful for me. You may recall Paul talking about that he could eat whatever he wants to eat. But, you know, maybe you don't, but you can. Um, because those things don't really matter. So I think that Paul is, is imagining the argument. All things are lawful for me. And his response is, yeah, but they're not all beneficial. Yeah, all things are lawful for me. He said again, and he says, yeah, but I'm not going to be dominated by anything. Yeah, but food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And Paul goes, yeah, and God will destroy both one and, and the other. Uh, again, destroy is a hard word there, I think. Um, but I think he is saying that, yes, and, and these things are all perishable. They're not eternal like God. They will disappear. So I think that Paul is imagining the argument 
um, around uh, around prostitutes, uh, which um, were popular in Corinth and have been popular in most places, actually. Um, when I say popular, meaning they were present, easy to find, um, and um, I'm not referring to sex workers. Uh, options have always been there. So, you know, enjoyed by the general populace, popular. Um, and so I think that's what he's talking about first. And someone said, yeah, but so all things are lawful for me. I mean, what's what's the big deal? So, yeah, fine. They, they are, but they're not beneficial, are they? Yeah, but, but you know, they're lawful for me. And, and I think Paul is also recognizing what happens for us in... Um, in sexual relationships, that we um, end up investing uh, emotionally, and if we're not aware of the intimacy of what's going on, that we can lose perspective and become dominated by it. I, I would agree with Paul to some degree in that. And then I think here's the idea, yeah, but food's meant for the stomach, the stomach's meant for food, as if to say, hey, my body is built to, to respond sexually, so of course I'm going to. What's wrong with that? Um, so there should be no problem with me going to a sex worker. And Paul, I think, is saying, yeah, no, absolutely, but you, you understand that your body is perishable. You should be focusing on the eternal things. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord. That's when he gets into it, saying, okay, so you can use your body for all sorts of things. It's meant to do things. It can do things. It's capable of doing things. It wants to do things. You, you have urges and drives to do these things. Um, but, but if your primary focus is your relationship with God, then you need to consider all of that. So are these things beneficial to your relationship with God? Whatever these things may be. Here he's talking about sex. He's talking about sex workers. Um, I think he's being a little... Well, actually, no. I was about to say I think he's be demeaning to sex workers. No, he is. I was going to say the text doesn't say that. No, it it, it, it does. Uh, should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. That would be a terrible thing. So for Paul, I assume that prostitutes would not belong within that church community. If you were a prostitute, you would be shunned. I'm in inferring that from what he says. I might be wrong, and I'd love to hear that I am, but I think that's what Paul is saying. Um, Paul doesn't seem to recall Jesus having meals with prostitutes. I don't think he seems to recall about the things that people were say, saying about Mary of Magdala, uh, although perhaps those things weren't actually being said until sometime after, um, once the tradition builds up. Um, but... Yeah, so so Paul has a debt, has, has an issue with 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 sex workers. I I, I, I can I can see that, um, but Paul our, Paul's argument applies to everything, as far as I'm concerned. So I mean, I can look at food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach meant for food. I, I, sh I can eat anything I want, and yes, yes I can, um, but how does it fit into my relationship with God? So uh, if I eat. Um, to mask my feelings, and some of us do that. Um, would I not be better in, in, in dealing with those feelings spiritually, talking to God about my feelings, about, about, about those things? Uh, would I not be better to look for a spiritual response to the fact that I'm eating all the time? Why am I doing that all the time? Uh, if I am damaging my body by overeating, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. And it do doesn't help my relationship with God. Well, it doesn't hurt it. Yeah, maybe not, but it's not good, right? Paul's first thing, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. So Paul's asking us to consider the things that we do in our life and, 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 to, and to, to focus them on our relationship with God. That's what you're supposed to do in a faith community. And, and that's particularly true when we talk about intimacies. So I don't know that God cares about how I play chess. Um, but eating is an intimate act. Um, it, it, it's far more than just fueling the body. 
And, and so I sometimes will seek my intimacy in food, right? People eat when they're hurt. People eat when they celebrate. Uh, oh, honey, you hurt yourself. Have a cookie. You'll feel better. Wow, you got a new job. Congratulations. Here, let's open some champagne and eat this food. We're going to celebrate, right? So there's an intimacy to, to our eating, and maybe that distracts us from the intimacy that we could be cultivating with God. And, of course, that definitely applies when we talk about sex. Um, and Paul sort of talks about sex by not talking about sex here. But I think Paul's issue with, with sex workers um, is about the intimacy, right? Um, as he says, um, uh, where's, where's the line? I'm sorry, I'm looking at the text as I say this. Um, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? So there is, Paul recognizes there is an intimacy to a sexual act. And I believe that a healthy, spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy person recognizes the intimacy. Um, and, um, and, and, embraces it, engages it for whatever it is. I mean, I, I have a way of doing it, but I don't, I'm not suggesting that it should be normative. My name may be Norm, uh, but my understandings and practices don't have to be normative. I am more comfortable thinking of, of, uh, of, of sex uh, emerging from intimacy, right? So there's an intimate relationship that manifests itself in a sexual relationship that has serve me well in my life. I am happy that way. I don't know that I, um, I am typical or, or normative. Um, but that's how that works for me. Uh, and, and, and so I, I appreciate part of what Paul is saying. If I am craving intimacy and therefore try to find it in sex, that is to say the sex comes first with the hope that intimacy will follow, what happens for me then is uncontrolled intimacy. I feel things that I didn't know I was feeling or don't know how to feel. They may not be true feelings. They might be connected to a sexual response. And so I am connected in body, but I'm not really connected in, in, in spirit or in relationship. So I am confused. That's how I see it. Uh, and I think Paul sees that. So, so my relationship with a prostitute, with a sex worker, becomes confusing to me. And the only evidence I have for that as being something more than what I think would be people that I have met along the way professionally who have been in relationships with sex workers and been very hurt to discover that the sex worker didn't feel the same way. I have sat with people who have fallen in love with sex workers and can't understand why she or he is not responding. Um, so I get that confusion, I think. What Paul wants for me and for anybody in the church is to have, is to recognize a similarly intimate relationship with, with God, with the Spirit, with, with Jesus. Good Trinitarian, these are all one and the same. I'm not saying you're supposed to, not having sex with, but having that level of intimacy that, that with a human being may certainly manifest itself in, in a sexual relationship but the intimacy with God is similarly deep and powerful and life-shaping, life-forming. And, and, and Paul is asking for that. And for Paul, the best way to do that is to get rid of all those other things. So stop eating that way, Norm, because obviously there's an intimacy issue with you when you eat. Um, stop um, that sexual relationship because that one's not based on intimacy. That's based on something physical. And the physical is going to pass away. Why wouldn't you be investing yourself in the spiritual? So 
work on the intimacy that manifests in sex, not on the sex that you hope will manifest in intimacy. That seems to me to be Paul's advice. It's very heavy-handed advice. Um, it's like a lot of people of my generation or the generation before me that when talking about sex, we would rather be very dramatic about it because we don't want to talk quietly, informatively about it because there's a discomfort. And I think Paul has a great discomfort around this. Um, shun fornication, he just says. Uh, every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. What are you saying there, Paul? What are you saying there? Um, I think Paul is, is, um, is, is trying to figure out spirituality and sexual expression, sexuality, sexual activity. And these are all very, very loaded. And then he comes out with a statement that I'm not going to say it originates with Paul, but it's not particularly a gospel statement. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? God dwells in you in the same sense that God dwells in the temple. Paul is saying that. That is not something that's been said a lot before Paul. Now, he says, you're not your own, um, meaning that Jesus died on the cross for you, therefore, in a sense, Jesus owns you. Uh, you belong to Jesus, you belong to God. And in, in, in saying that to, to members of a community of faith, then that's absolutely true, in a sense. That is part of you know the theology that brought you here, or the theology that you espouse now that you are here. And so Paul's reminding of that, but but then to say that, yes, but but you, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's within you, comes from God. God is within you. So treat your body well. Don't, don't confuse intimate growth by going to sex workers or by, I would say, we could also include um, eating badly, whatever that might mean. That might mean drunkenness, that might mean obesity, uh, that might mean, I don't know, all sorts of things it could possibly mean. Um, going back to that first thing, all things are lawful for me. Paul doesn't dispute that, this idea that, that, that you are forgiven, that you are one with God, but being in that relationship with God, then you should be doing the things that are beneficial to that relationship. Again, I'll use sort of a, a, a cis-heteronormative um, situation. Um, I can be, uh, I am very happily married to, to my wife, actually, wedding anniversary tomorrow. Um, have been for a very long time, and uh, I suppose I could gaze at a beautiful woman and say, what? There's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm happily married. I'm not doing anything about it. And somebody who knows me well, if I was doing that, might say, yeah, Norbert, how is it actually helping your marriage? I mean, you love your wife, right? That's, that's your primary relationship for you. So staring at that woman going by, how is that benefiting? Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm allowed to do it. Yeah, I know, but how is it, how is it benefiting you? Well, I know, but I should be allowed to do it. Yeah, but how is it benefiting? How does this help your relationship with your wife? Or, or is it distracting you? Paul would say dominating. I will not be dominated by anything. How is it distracting you, taking you away from your the focus that you want to have? Yeah, I know, but I'm just a man, and that's just she, she's just she's that's a pretty woman. I don't know. And one day you're going to grow old, and you are not going to be as attractive as you are today. And one day your wife is going to grow old and, and will not appear as attractive as that woman who just walked by perhaps one day. Um, does that mean then that you're, you expect your relationship to deteriorate? You're no longer as attractive. She's no longer as attractive. Is that all that binds you? Because I would think, Norm, if you really valued that relationship and loved your wife and loved yourself, that you would be working on the intimacy that allows you to grow old together and to be beautiful together always. Huh? 
Okay, I went down a little garden path there. But I think that's what Paul is getting at when it comes to our intimate relationship with God. And we don't often talk about our intimate relationship with God because it sounds like we're talking about sex. We don't want to talk about sex with God. Um, Sex is the thing we have difficulty discussing. And yet, Paul is reminding us that our relationship with God is intimate, powerfully intimate. And if we don't have some sense of of, of what intimacy means in our lives and how we cultivate inti- intimacy and how we respond in intimate relationships. If we don't work on that, then we are going to find ourselves drifting from God. So, focus on that. For Paul, that's like, so, enough with sex workers. Don't you dare do that. Um, I don't know. I don't have that kind of relationship, so I can't, I can't judge it. Um, the same way that Paul wants to judge it here. Um, I only know it works for me. And oddly, Paul and I would probably be getting along on this, not as policy, but as it applies to me. Anyway, I'm going to leave it with you to think about that, to think about this this idea that your body is a, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Uh, that, is, that is a gift from God. Uh, and what that means in terms of how we use our bodies what we eat, what we say, all those other things. Um, But I'm going to leave it now and just close with a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to wonder. To wonder about the things that we often do not talk about. To question, to listen, and to hear not just the voices of others, but to hear your voice, your word. God, we ask that our wondering today be beneficial, that it help us grow in faith and develop a more intimate relationship with you. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's it for me today, but I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow. Uh, Until I get to see you, just God bless you. Um, Please know that God sees you, that in fact, you are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Uh, And that's maybe how God's love moves through you out into the world. So um, don't ever doubt how important you are. And uh, yeah, consider this reading and see what it means to you in that context. Anyway, until I get to see you, God bless you.